Do this. So um, welcome everyone to um, Travelling Companions Exhibition Artist Talk. Um, my name is Rose Banky and with me today are the two artists, Faye Ballard with the white background and Judy Goldhill with the black background, um, which for me are in the top row of my Zoom, um, who are going to talk you through a few of their works in the exhibition. Um, but because we're all sitting here together in Zoom and not in the exhibition space itself, I thought I'd start by giving a little context. So the exhibition Travelling Companions originally opened on the 2nd of March 2020 in the gallery space of the Alison Richard building um, in the University of Cambridge and it's home for the Centre for Research into the Arts, Social Science and Humanities or CRASH as they like to call it. It's a space that functions both as a designated gallery led by um, Judith who you just met as well as being the foyer and atrium to the seminar rooms and teaching spaces as well as a cafe that the building houses. Because of this, in no way is it a white cube gallery space. Um, the exhibition audience will often consist of students, academics, or just casual passers-by, um, as well as sort of gallery visitors who come specifically for the exhibition. And um, after I've introduced this, Judy's going to show you a film which will actually show you the gallery a little bit. But for me, it's one of the reasons, um, it's why it's a really interesting place to exhibit, because you will get casual encounters between the work and people that are just passing through and hadn't meant to engage with it at all. So my role was as curator. Um, I'm trained as an architect originally, but for the last 20 years, I've been teaching and writing about interior space, looking at how people construct their identity through the spaces that they inhabit and the role of evocative objects in this process. I often refer to psychoanalysis and it's probably not an accident that I originally met Faye and Judy at the Freud Museum following their previous joint exhibition called Breathe, which was held there on the role of loss and mourning in their work. In her book, Evocative Objects, Things We Think With, Professor Sherry Turkle, a psychologist at MIT, suggests that objects act as emotional and intellectual companions that anchor memories, sustain relationships and provoke new ideas. She writes, we find it familiar to consider objects as useful or aesthetic, as necessities or even vain indulgences, but we're on less familiar ground when we consider objects as companions to our emotional lives or provocations to thought. Now the exhibition um, really tries to explore this idea of objects as provocations to thought and the way that such evocative objects travel with us, acting as emotional co companions to us as we negotiate our lives. It does this by contrasting the very different work in terms of content, medium and scale of the two artists in order to kind of create a conversation between them. So on Faye's case, Faye's mother died on a family holiday in Spain when she was seven years old. The work exhibited is a series of very careful pencil drawings of objects belonging to her family that she found when clearing her father's house some 40 years later. Each object told a story and brought memories flooding back. In contrast, Judy's photographs of the night sky, together with the massive observatories and telescopes, allow us to look beyond this world. Um, the sky is offering sights of wonder and a sense of far away, but also the familiarity of home. Trad traditionally, constellations of stars have acted as navigational tools, guiding travellers and giving direction, acting as a different sort of travelling companion to phase domestic objects. Now, we realise the concept of travelling companion is universally applicable. And as a means to expand on themes of the physical exhibition, we invited 31 what we termed fellow travellers to describe their travelling companions in image and text in the form of an online exhibition. And we um, kind of raided our address books and there was a writer, an artist, a psychoanalyst, a musician, an astronomer, a doctor, a priest, and even someone um, studying polar exploration who happens to be in the room. Um, and that's available online and the link to it's on the chat, but these, um, the ones that expand on the theme, they varied from representations of self, of home, to someone loved, to more practical things that the individual just couldn't travel without, including a corkscrew. And I recommend you take a look and you'll find a few familiar names. So we opened with a private view. We held a seminar and panel, panel discussion called Who or What is Your Travelling Companion, which we ran with the Cambridge Science Festival. And Judy and Faye gave a tour of the exhibition for Friends of Kettle's Yard. The day after the tour, the building closed due to the pandemic and the exhibition, which should have come down in Easter that year, hung suspended in time until it's opened a year and a half later on the 10th of October this autumn. 
It was a set of events none of us expected. It gave um, Faye and Judy their longest ever running exhibition. And it gave the um, online exhibition much greater visibility than perhaps we'd originally expected. It also gave us a lot of time to reflect. And what I want to do now is to hand over um, first to Judy and then to Faye to allow them to reflect on where they are now. But we'll start with a little film. And as Judy said, after that, we um, were really hoping to have questions and a bit of a discussion. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank you, Rose, for your um, uh, presentation. Um, I'm now gonna try and share my screen. Um, so this is um, this is the film that um, we made of the show um, to give you an idea of the exhibition space in Cambridge, the scale and the hang. The last moments of the film are of the seminar which Ro just discussed with the invited speakers to the panel discussion of who or what is your travelling companion. <laughs> Um, so I photographed the night sky together with the oh, <laughs> together with the um, massive observatories and telescopes that allow us to look at the world beyond this world. Traditionally, constellations of stars have acted as navigational tools, guiding travellers and giving directions, adding as a different sort of travelling companion to phase domestic objects. This exhibition contrasts the two scales, the personal and the collective, exploring how familiar objects act as traveling companions, both in the present and as remembered objects, their function and their stories telling their changing over the course of a lifetime. 
I've been fortunate to have held residence in the astronomical observatories in North and South America. Photographing the skies and machinery that image the past, showing ancient light. All was situated on top of the most sacred spots imaginable, in the Rockies, the Andes, and the highest volcano of Mauna Kea, Hawaii. Equipment continues to compel my work. Machines that make the invisible visible. The machinery for looking. The massive telescopes and observatories that allow us to look beyond the earth beyond the edges of perception, looking to the heavens for the unknown. Faye and I collaborated on the exhibition Breeze at the Freud Museum, exploring early parental loss. Despite it being a joint exhibition, the only images that we showed together were these, which greeted the observer on arrival in the evocative last home of Sigmund Freud. A metaphor of our obsessions, Faye drawing the objects relating to her family, mother, memories, and I, the planetary objects, far away phenomenon that I have witnessed. The right hand image, though black and white, is actually of the sun and is of an annular solar eclipse taken in the magnificent solar observatory on Kids Peak in Arizona, the largest solar telescope in the world. The scale has been massively reduced in this case to be exhibited in tandem with Faye's mother's swimming cap. The cap in its three-dimensional, beautifully crafted precision and the sun with his glitches, solar spots and strange scratchings. This photograph was also taken in the solar telescope. Whilst I was working in the observatory, I looked up to see one of the mirrors to find these dazzling filters above my head. They were glowing with the intensity of the sun's rays, illuminating the scratched perspex filters in the room. To me, it looked like an illustration of the gas giants of our planetary solar system and totally mysterious. The construction of this exhibition, as you saw in, in the film, was for our works to set up a dialogue together reconfigured to talk to each other, as in this pairing of Faye's drawing of her mother's fan and my photograph of the Milky Way, which I've also got behind me, um, contrasting the enormity of the skies and the delicacy of this handheld object, the micro and the macro, the power of touch, and those celestial objects that imbue wonder and awe in the dramatic theater of the skies. After much consideration, my choice for traveling companions of what or who is your traveling companion is actually my retina. This is a layer of tissue in the back of your eye that senses light and sends images to your brain, facilitating the act of looking and seeing. The retina is to the eye as film is to a camera. It is highly stable and hardly ever changes over a lifetime. Because of the high number of unique data points the retina possesses, there's almost no error, so that when the identity of an individual is confirmed, it is truly that person, that individual, that signature. So this is truly me, my body, myself, and imaged by, imaged by my ophthalmologist. And this is a poem that I wrote to accompany the show. All horizons seem internal to my eye, which senses inside itself a tropical world with crackling black light, a yellow sun presiding over the secret flora of my short green lids from a coral sky. These roaming globes have received the dark light of chambers of Egyptian tombs crumbling rocks in the Allura Caves, the translucent modes of Ladakh, stars in the Negev Desert, suspended Saturn, and in the dusty wings of a sparrow, far away galaxies, sadness, the flesh at the birth of my grandchild, and fleetingly my father, dead after just 12 months of my life. Long gone grandparents, these globes still looking into my mother's eyes, my children's eyes, my children's children's eyes too, 
all enthralled by the light and my lens of the world. Photography has been my passion from when I was first given my box, my first box brownie, aged about eight years old. The augmented, this augmented the magic of looking, which enhanced and bewitched me. From the darkness of the darkroom to the somewhat questionable liberation of working on a computer. Many of the photographs in this exhibition are light years away from Earth, and they generate for me a condition of intimate immediacy. This image was taken of the Victor Blanco telescope high up in the Andes in Cerro Tololo, Chile. My artist residency in Chile came from an invitation following the first residency on Kitt Peak to attend the launch of the dark energy camera. Dark energy, the thing we cannot see, mysterious and invisible outside our human and biological receptors is estimated to make up 85% of all matter in the universe. This cam the camera for the dark energy is situated in this actual observatory although now it's moved to Kitt Peak, bizarrely. The soft white smudge on the top left of the image of the, is of the large Magellanic cloud high up in the southern skies. The sky was so very clear and bursting with stars. This image bathed in red eye, light is actually not ideal for the observing astronomers. They can only operate with no extraneous light at all which is why they're in such kind of remote places. The red in this photograph actually was from the reflection from car brakes as they descended down the treacherous mountain road. Additionally, with the car engine turned off, so to avoid any interference with the vibrations of the equipment that the astronomers are using. A terrifying experience driving freestyle down the mountain. My favourite part of actually of this image is the little light leaking from the door on the right hand side of the observatory. It feels to me like an image from Alice in Wonderland, playing with our sense of scale. The exact twin of that observatory is in Twin Kitt Peak, where the dark energy camera is now based. I photographed the underneath cavern of the platform for the John Mayall telescope. It's hard to comprehend the scale of this vast circular space with its curving thick concrete walls. For me, it is a visual echo of the voyage up to the sky, something out of a children's book or a Wes Anderson movie with some exciting planetary configuration at its apex. Above this concrete void sits the massive four meter telescope Apparently, the musician Carlos Santana was so captivated by this space that he spent two solitary hours meditating inside this acoustic magical chamber. People build these structures to try and understand what they don't know, said the director of Kit Peak to me as we were going into the telescope. A great quote that leads me on to this photograph a photograph that I took in CERN, another massive machine which is designed to make the invisible visible, an experiment that gives evidence of the structure of the subatomic world and the laws of nature governing it. CERN is the world's largest laboratory and is de dedicated to the pursuit of fundamental science. The Large Hadron Collider allowed scientists ah. Um, to reproduce conditions within a billionth of a second after the Big Bang by colliding beams of energy protons or ions at colossal speeds close to the speed of light. I visited when the large Hagrodon Collider was being repaired, the only time people are allowed in it, obviously. It was so thrilling to be underground in this gigantic experiment happening in a massive circular tunnel dug deep under the Jura Mountains and the environs of Geneva. So moving on to this, a different type of particle that occur mainly around the polar regions and are dependent on the amount of acceleration imparted to the precipitating particles. Auroras are the result of disturbances in the magnetosphere caused by solar wind. 
These disturbances alter the trajectories of charged particles in the magnetospheric plasma. These particles, mainly electrons and protons, precipitate into the upper atmosphere. And these photographs were taken in the wilderness of the Northwestern Territories in Canada in subhuman temperatures. I've never known such cold. Much of my artist practice has been concerned with discovering more about my father, who I never knew, and has mentioned died when I was a baby. It was suggested by the curator of the Freud Museum exhibition that I'm possibly looking for my father in the stars, the heavens. She wrote that maybe I'm as occupied with the equipment for seeing as I am of the mysterious nature of what it is that the equipment sees. The mystery is part of the answer. Where is he? Where is she? Where does the lost person go when they can no longer be found in the world? It might just be possible to find them in outer space, perhaps the modern version of what some called heaven, as to find them in the relics of an earthly and domestic engagement with the world. Roe um, asked us to reflect on the lockdown and, and what happened during that time and how our work has progressed, progressed during this strange pandemic that we lived through. I was selected to make an artist book for the collective A.M. Bruno under the generic title Volume. My choice in this was to use the word volume in its multiple meanings, the volume of space and the actual volume of the book. Um, I'm now going to try and um, uh, show you a film, which is a film of the book. This book, present as in present, past and future, whilst referencing my father, is based on recalled and imagined spaces. It's a version of the house that we carry with us throughout our lives. The blueprint of our very first home, the one that we seek to replicate in those that are to follow. It is a kind of future ghost house and for me, a possible traveling companion. The soft back flip book with its two way opening contains strong memories, musings and dreams in moonlight, including the only ho home my architect father designed for a client before he died from the last pandemic, that of polio. This home was not mine, but I've appropriated it as my own and photographed it. He constructed portals, windows, fireplaces and doorways which are my entry into a world of reverie and imagination. Um, and, um, oh, sorry, I'm now going to unshare my screen and hand over to Faye. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, thanks, Ro. Thanks, Judy. Thank you all for being here. Um, Unfortunately, I wasn't able to screen share my images um, myself today. So Judith has very kindly got my images and is going to do it for me. I'm very grateful. So if you hear me saying uh, next one, please, you know, Judith's there doing it for me. So thank you. Um, that was a great uh, presentation, Judy, and it really reminded me of that sense of you looking into the stars, um, you know, possibly searching for your dad. Uh, and me, uh, you know, absolutely in the floorboards of my dad's home, my childhood home, finding objects, forensically looking for evidence of my mum. So there I am really digging down, you know, in the detail. And it's such a contrast that we were able to do at Cambridge, I think. We didn't, 
in a way, looking back, we didn't quite pull it off at Freud because we had separate rooms. But I think at Cambridge, those images really came together and they started to sing, didn't they? You know, there was this lovely juxtaposition. Um, you know, so I had my mother's drawing of Playtex Girdle, a memory that I had of her, um, next to your wonderful um, image of an observatory. And there was something about the texture and the form that really worked, I thought. So now I'm gonna spend a few minutes just um, giving some background information to my drawings, uh, particularly for those here today who don't know my work. Um, so we start with a, a drawing of my mum. This was a drawing I made um, in 2012. Um, but I want to give you a bit of background first, so, so it's all in context. Um, Basically, uh, my journey began uh, when my dad died in 2009. And my dad had brought me up with my brother and sister on his own um, in an incredible way. He was a fantastic mummy daddy. Um, my mother died when I was seven in 1964 on a Spanish, in, in Spain as Roe mentioned, on a nice family holiday, our first holiday abroad. And we came back and very quickly, we didn't mention her again. And we didn't mention her throughout our lives. Um, so when my dad died in 2009, I hadn't mentioned my mother once to him, nor to my brother, nor to my sister. And what happened, I had this terrible sense of grief for this huge figure in my life, this mommy daddy who you know, brought me up, as I said. But I also realized I had this unexpected, extraordinary feeling of grief as if I had tectonic plates that were sort of opening and all this stuff was coming out. And it was basically, I think, raw grief for my mum. And I realized that I didn't know my mother and I needed to find out about her. So I started clearing the family home um, uh, after my dad's death and I started coming across photographs of her that I hadn't seen before. So they had been there all that time where, when I was brought up but they had been under piles of other things and I didn't know they were there and I felt that the only way for me to get close to her, to reinstate her, to acknowledge her existence was for me to draw her so this is a drawing I made from one of those photographs. And for me, it was extraordinary. I could see her nose, um, her eyebrows, uh, what sort of shoes she might have worn, little ham her, le her leather black handbag. She's got gloves on. Um, it was a revelation, absolute revelation. It was an incredible uh, moment for me. Um, and then I went on a journey. So um, Judith, if you could just show the next slide, that would be great. Thank you. Lovely. So this is my mother's watch. Now I've got the real thing here. Um, it's very precious object. When my mum died, I, I took from, the, from the, be the bedroom in Spain, her watch, this, this watch, and I kept it and I kept it hidden, didn't tell my dad didn't tell anyone and I sort of didn't look at it because I, I think I felt a bit disloyal looking at it because we didn't talk about my mum. So off it went into a drawer and it stayed there. Um, anyhow, I get it out now and it, it's very much here with me. But it was the first thing about my mother I started to draw and it really was a cathartic moment because by drawing this watch, I felt I was drawing her. And I've been, you know, I've spent a lot of time thinking about this watch. And this watch is my mother. It, it, it isn't a thing that tells the time. It's nothing to do with that. This is my mother. And it goes back to um, Roe was talking about um, this wonderful book, which I've got here as well. Um, uh, one of my favorite books, Evocative Objects um, by Sherry Turtle. You know, this, this, this object 
is my mother. It's it's not just, uh, as I say, some functional object. Um, it's charged with memories of her. Um, but for me, it is her. It's it's my holy relic, I suppose, in many ways. Um, next slide, please, Judith. Thank you. I found on my dad's writing desk my mum's um, powder compact. And I do actually remember her using a powder compact. I remember that lovely downy, you know, cheek uh, with, with the lovely powder close up to her and smelling that powder. Um, so this was very poignant to me. Um, next slide, please. And then I started to draw memories of my mum. So I mentioned a bit earlier that Playtex Girdle, here it is, uh, which was with Judy, was shown with Judy's um, photographs um, of observatories. And I, you know, I can remember as a child, small child, I loved fiddling around with that little clip, the little clip that I've, I've drawn in quite a lot of detail there. And then it had this lovely smooth satiny front and this lovely textured side to it. Um, next slide, please, Judith. Uh, this is my mum's uh, teddy bear that we used to walk around with, uh, just a joy to walk around with it. And I, I wanted to try and draw it. Um, next, please. Uh, the fan. Um, on that holiday, my birthday was the 24th of August, my mum's was the 25th. And I said to my parents, could I have a fan? I didn't want one of those little touristy ones, I wanted a proper fan. So we went into Alicante and I remember these sort of dark, shady shops. And we found a lovely big fan for me. Um, but the next thing I remember is that my mum was asking to use it because she had such a high fever. And then I never saw the fan again. And I've, I have to say, I've never enjoyed my birthday and I've never had a birthday party. Um, and it must, you know, there must be some terrible, <laughs> thing that reminds me so much of of destruction I think when uh, you know associate death with birthdays basically next slide please and this is Judy was showing um, a drawing of the a memory of my mum's swimming cap and here it is um, uh, I remember her taking me swimming to the local pool and um, she wore one of these wonderful 1960s caps. Next slide, please. Uh, a rug, a, well, a blanket actually, that was on my bed um, that I think was probably from my mum's family, a Welsh family uh, where they lived in North Wales and uh, this was a Welsh blanket. I've still got this blanket. I loved using this blanket. Um, next slide, please. Uh, and then a dried up lemon. I started to do things beyond my mum. So things that were part of the family, you know, just part of the family. And, and we put this lemon, I can't remember who put it on the mantelpiece um, uh, at home. Um, I must have been about 10 or 11 at the time and it just stayed there. And when I was clearing my dad's house, it was still there. So I mean, this lemon must be, you know, it's 45 years old or something. So I often think about this lemon and what it meant to my dad. And for him, maybe it was one of his traveling companions, you know, because it reminded him of maybe his three kids who, who, who'd left home, or maybe it reminded him of a particular memory um, during that, you know, the 1970s when it probably went on to the mantelpiece. I've no, I, and I can't ask him, it's such a shame, but uh, there we are. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and this I found. Uh, I had a lovely dog for, for, for a birthday and uh, the dog escaped and held up the traffic. And my dad got a phone call from the police saying that the dog was in jail um, and he'd have to come and uh, take the dog away and pay the fine. And my dad was really, <laughs> really cross and wanted me to go and get it because he didn't want a record. Um, and I didn't know how it was resolved, except we did get the dog back, I can't remember, but, the, but then I found this and it just brought it all back. And it's such a joy to find this little, little thing, this little certificate 
tiny and I've still got it. I've got it you know, here in this particular room where I'm sitting, in fact. Next one, please. Ah, oh, my troll. This was definitely my childhood traveling companion. Um, this went troll, ginger, because that ginger hair went everywhere with me for years. Um, sadly, I don't know where Ginger is now. Next one, please. And then I put many of these objects um, or drawings of these objects in a, in a large memory box. And Judy's film at the beginning, you could probably see some of those boxes. There were three of them all together. So this is one which is called Drawn from Life because all these objects were drawn from life. I have all these objects. And then the next one, please, uh, Judith, is um, the memory, um, just pure memories of, of different memories I have of my mom, um, my childhood. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is um, an inventory. I have, have an inventory for each three boxes. Um, I'm sorry, it's, you can't read them, but it's, it's, it's very basic. It's, it's a bit like, um, a sort of local house sale or something where, where you just get the name, what it is, and then a brief description because I want to help uh, the viewer by giving a little bit of information. Um, next slide, please. And then this one was, to, this memory box was about my dad. Um, and I'd been reading another great book, um, Daniel Miller's book, Stuff at the time. And he was talking about, um, the objects defining us, being us, becoming us, and that we can edit our lives through deciding what objects to throw away, what to keep. And I was thinking, wow, yeah, these objects are my dad. I mean, my, the watch might be my mum, but these objects are my dad um, for me. This is my dad. This, he, this is him. Um, I rec this is what I, I, I recognise as him. Um, Next slide, please. And then I decided I needed to do some um, drawings of the house like where these objects were. So I made some little studies of the house before um, selling it. Um, uh, yeah, so this is one. Uh, Judith, next slide, please. This is another one. Those are tiny. These were well, not tiny, but they're on A4 paper. And one more, please. There they are. And there's a sort of stillness about these I like. Next slide, please. And then I decided to make a little series um, uh, about things my dad said to me. So he, one of his favorite phrases was always follow your obsessions. And these are a couple of Bakelite plugs, um, the switches to the toilet and the bathroom. Next one, please. And I remember as a little girl trying to reach that door handle and not being able to, and it was shut and being so frustrated. And we called that room the nursery. I mean, what a name, the nursery. But anyway, there we go. Um, keep, if you could do the next one, Judith, please. And there's another one, suburbia, being brought up in Shepparton, um, suburbia. Sundays were always so depressing. Everything was so quiet. And then finally, um, you know, the, what's happened in the last 18 months while Travelling Companion has been um, locked up? Well, my work changed very much. Um, I started making circles during lockdown and I've made about 45 circles, in fact. And these are a couple of them now on show at uh, a gallery called Handle Street Projects in Islington. Um, and I'm still trying to work out what they are. Uh, in my own head, um, whether there's some form of resolution because I've worked so much trying to find my mum. And I've come to a point where I do feel she's internalized in me now. Um, uh, or maybe they're sort of nests because they, I must say during lockdown, I, I found, or well, shelters, I found it incredibly um, uh, comforting to make these. Um, and then I was thinking, you know, Ro posed this question to us and I was thinking, well, other things, I think I'm much more aware of my body, my bodily space 
if that doesn't sound, I, I don't know how to express this, but I think, yeah, my body, my, my space, and much more appreciative of where I live, my home, and indeed these objects um, which live with me. Um, yeah, I think that's probably, I'll make sure I've said everything. I've got some notes here, but I think I have, yeah, I think I've said everything. Thank you. Thank you so much, Faye. That, that was um, really nice. And thank you both for uh, like actually the reflection on where we've got to now, because um, I've always known about private views, but I hadn't realized that exhibitions have closing, closing events as well. And then having a clothing, clo clothing event, a closing event, but in Zoom is a, 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 seems a very abstracted um, event in some way. So it's, I think it's really nice to project into the future. I'm going to open it up um, to questions, but I wanted to ask the two of you, and I, I'd maybe both answer it. Um, one question, because it's been an interesting process creating um, the exhibition, which wasn't something I knew about particularly, and particularly all the conversations we've had. And you know, everyone in the room will have seen how different your work is. Um, what is it that you enjoy about working and exhibiting with each other? Because you've done Breathe, as mentioned. We've done Travelling Companions, which mm. is another version. And I know you've got another exhibition coming up working together. But I think every time you do it, you learn something about each other because there is this sort of conversation going on. And I just wondered if you both wanted to say a little bit, um, perhaps why you're each other's Travelling Companions? Yeah, I, I can, shall I just say a few things? I love working with Judy. I mean, if you know Judy, you know that she's one of the loveliest, loving, warm, funny people you'll ever meet. Um, she's so generous, she's adorable. And um, she puts up with me, I'm, I'm not such an easy character, but she puts up with me really well. I think we just get on well, you know, I think it's a really good relationship. It's a really good collaboration. And the other thing is that Judy isn't competitive. And this is so important because I hope I'm not either. And we can just enjoy each other's work. I love Judy's work. You know, we can enjoy each other's work. We can enjoy each other's success because we, we do collaborate, but we do a lot of other things as well. And Judy's the first person to say, you know, fantastic, go for it, girl. You know, it's just so wonderful working with her. And somehow it all works. I don't know how. We don't sit down and say, okay, you're going to handle that. I'm going to do that. It just, just sort of works. It's really interesting. That bit I can really confirm, having worked with you, <laughs> it just works. <laughs> Ju Judy, do you want any reflections and perhaps just describe a little bit your next collaboration that's coming up? Mm. Well, um, I just wanted to say that um, my working with Faye is, is fantastic for me as well because she's um, incredibly organised and I, I tend to be a bit chaotic and scatty at times. And um, she's very patient with me, particularly about... Um, <laughs> where inverted commas go and um, <laughs> <it's like that. laughs> I think I was away when I did punctuation at school and so I don't really understand so but I agree also with the phase I mean our work is so different we 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 don't compete in, a, in a, any level at all and we can be very honest with each other and um, I, I find um, Faye a kind of fount of creativity and beauty and um, her work, yeah, I really admire her work. And I just, I'm going to see the circles next week. I've seen some brewing up in her studio, but um, I'm really looking forward to seeing them. And it's, I, we, you know, I just think it, it's, it, it's been going on for quite some time. And I, I, I hope it, uh, yes, we, our next collaboration is um, actually from a talk a bit similar to this that we did a few months ago during lockdown. Um, and, um, for Birkbeck and um, we are now having a show there at the Peltz Gallery in the spring and it's called Mending the Psyche and it's moving on from from these shows really of what we've done so far so it, it has a wonderful kind of um, momentum that it keeps going after the work kind of has a life of its own and it it's carrying us 
along to the next stage. And in fact, we're meeting tomorrow to look at the space and discuss what we're going to do. And, and again, like we have with traveling companions, we're going to pull other people into the exhibition and we're going to have talks and debates. And so I'm exciting to keep moving it on. Because I, I've just, it's one of the nicest things working with you. It's not been about a singular moment or event. It's a sort of um, continuing thing, which of course this strange situation we are with this very long running exhibition now sh sh shows how kind of evolutionary it is. Um, I kind of would love to open it now to the audience. Um, if people want to turn their cameras, it would be really nice to see you all because I see names that I haven't people who haven't faced haven't seen for ages and I just wondered does anyone have a question I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed it all I enjoyed both the, seeing both their work on 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 screen and it was very very enjoyable thank you very very much indeed it was great that's all really Thank you. I would like to ask a question. Um, so I really love working with you both and putting up the exhibition. It was great fun. And, you know, it's been it's been kind of asleep for almost two years in our space. And then I emailed our building manager and I said, I think because they started to open the building up again and and I said, you know, what, what about the exhibition? Are we allowed to get pe to, to, for people to come back in the building that aren't, you know, staff or students? And he, and he was so excited about, you know, taking off all the covers. And five minutes later, they uncovered all the artwork and, it, it, and they were just, you know, it was like, oh my God, life is coming back. So it was just really nice. Um, and so like thinking about your work, so like Judy, you, you sort of, your work starts, kind of like from the outside in, from the really big, you know, thing. And 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 Faye, you start kind of like from the inside out, from the really private. To the, and I wondered, is there a bit where you thought, like, is there is there a corner of the exhibition or a, or, or a juxtaposition of works where you think that these two sort of directions intersected, kind of like where you sort of at the same point, if, if you see what I mean? Ooh. I wonder, you know, I wonder whether you, um, whether you felt like, oh, these these two works are almost like balanced from the sort of where they're coming from. I, I had one idea, um, sort of gut feel. Uh, see what Judy thinks of it. Um, uh, I showed a, a, a portrait pencil drawing of my mum, which I showed earlier on, and actually Judy showed as well. Where it split. Um, you know, uh, her torso and then her legs and her handbag and so on. Um, and Judy um, showed, in fact, um, a mammogram image of her breast. And there was something very maternal and feminine about these two works coming together and something very intimate about them. And I thought at, at a very deep level, Judy and I were connecting but not necessarily, and no one, else, no one else would know that, but I felt it very strongly and it was very poignant. I think that was the, um, possibly the only point of connection, I think, um, with our work. Although Ro, I've lost Ro. Did you not think, you, you like the, with the girdle, um, Faye's girdle and, um, I just compared the interiors, the interior of Faye's model, mother's girdle, it seems so strange even to say that, <laughs> the um, telescope, the, pit, the one you showed the picture of, oh. that you've got these soft kind of female curved forms, um, so they, they in some way were sort of comparable as interior spaces, but um, so I thought that was a really nice bit how you hung those two images um, mm. together. Mm. Yeah, and you could say the same with the, the fan and, and the, the Milky Way, Judy, I was thinking, because in the fan I use a lot of charcoal and it's very, you know, it's very opaque and dark. And then you've got the darkness of the Milky Way. Um, 
I think the may, there was something in those, those two images for me that worked really well. Maybe on a subatomical level, because it's carbon, isn't it? It's, it's all uh, yeah, yeah. Particles, and it, I mean, if we want to take it to that to, to that level, it could yes, it could be that of mat the materiality of space and and charcoal carbon. So, so mm -hmm. I thought. I think it was a really great question, Judith, because I think um, yeah. how pieces go together completely changes them. I mean, the Freud Museums had a whole exhibition trajectory just on letting artists put insertions against Freud's furniture and objects. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, one of the reasons I'm interested, I asked Judy and Faye about what are they doing in the next collaboration is every time they put their work together, something different happens. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really um, fascinating. I can see a question in the chat. Sarah, I wondered if you wanted to read it aloud. Sure. Hello, Faye and Judy. It's good to it's good to see you again, even though it's it's through a screen. And um, and it was wonderful to see your pieces together after having been having been locked up um, and not physically accessible for about a year and a half. So, so and lovely to hear all of your thoughts. And I was curious if you had anything more to say about the. Uh, not just the ways in which the pandemic has affected you and your work, but has affected the idea of traveling and the ways that we might mm -hmm. sort of rethink what, what it means to travel now that we've all been locked down for the last almost two years and how objects might help in that way, either by thinking about uh, how objects might remind us of past travels or the things that we have change the way that we think about moving even if we can't go very far in our physical space. Um, I was very aware when I was putting this presentation together how um, kind of glad that I'd done all that traveling <laughs> in the past because I was just thinking, you know, I'm throwing out it's Arizona, it's Chile, it's Hawaii. Um, and, and I'm thinking, I'm not sure I would do that now because I my attitude to traveling is is actually very difficult different and the object I think is a, you know it's a very important thing this traveling companion because I I feel as I'm kind of getting older that maybe I don't need to travel so much to do to get those experiences that I did have and that maybe memories or photographs or something would you know would do it or an object um but maybe by next year I've changed my mind. But I just, I, I think maybe the idea of traveling has, yeah, has become um, a, a tricky, a tricky thing. Yeah, and Sarah, I think for me, it's about an internal journey. It, it's a psychological journey inside my head. It, it's not really about traveling around the, the planet. It's, it's, it's about traveling inside my head and getting, you know, I've been thinking quite a lot about the idea of a psychic home, you know, where, where do I feel at home? How, where does my soul feel at home? And I think that's where I'm in, that's the traveling I'm interested in. It's some very private internal traveling. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Mm. How are you feeling? How are you, Sarah? I mean, how do you feel? Um, how do you feel? I, mean, I, I think that uh, one of the things I think that is interesting is that, um, so as um, uh, uh, Ro and Faye and Judy know, I'm a graduate student and uh, the way that academics come together has changed quite a bit, of course, in the last year and a half as it has for everyone. Mm -hmm. But um, there are a lot of people who are saying that, you know, they're eager to get away from doing online events, especially doing online conferences, and they're eager to see people in person again and to have more spontaneous conversations. And then there are a lot of people who are saying, you know, for, for many years, those of us who couldn't travel were excluded from those spaces, either because they were people who had um, uh, physical reasons, who had disabilities and couldn't travel, or they had young children at home or people in their families they were caring for, or they just were from institutions that didn't have a lot of money to pay people to travel to these kinds of events. And so they're saying, well, we, we had always pushed to do more things online. We did it for the last year and a half because of the pandemic. And it shows that those kinds of things can work. And now you want to take this away from us. So, and you want to go back to meeting in person and excluding us from these spaces again. So I think that that, that has been really interesting. And, and I hope that 
I hope that e even though I I know myself, I'm there are people that I'm eager to see in person again. That we we not forget that doing things online opens spaces up to a lot of people who wouldn't normally be able to travel in person, and that we don't lose that. Even though I'm sure we're you know many of us would would like to um, would like to 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 sort of physically move around and and maybe get out of our homes uh, for for longer and stretch our legs. I think it's a really good point because I'm sure we wouldn't all be at Cambridge on a Tuesday evening after work kind of thing. Um, but and I did also think um, as um, you showed your work, I, I could see it in detail on my screen and I really enjoyed that. And if one was walking around the gallery and you're in a group, you'd be like if you were the person standing at the back, you wouldn't see it in that kind of way. But each of us on Zoom gets the same view. And that's actually a very nice way when you're talking through your work, actually to see work, it, it, it works very well. Um, we have some more questions. Um, I'm, everyone who's put, very politely putting it in the chat, I'm just going to ask whether you would like to read them. So there's Rosie Martin. Do you want to read your question? Hi, I was curious about the whole problem, as we know, of things being shut down. Um, and when you went to see the ex exhibition again, after a year and a half. Did you see the installation differently? Were there almost surprises when you came back and saw it again? Yes, of course, you've been involved in the whole process of the making and putting together, but were there any things you noticed afresh or anew, almost coming out of this closing down of the last year and a half? Uh, and also, this question about how you chose to put the works together, I think is, is really fascinating. Yes, of course, I saw the show at Freud, but in this one, you've actually chosen to make the works talk mm. in a different way. Mm. I, um, I went back a couple of weeks ago and I, it, was a, it was kind of bittersweet because it was, it was strange because I think I've changed since mm. we show up and um I, I mean it was right at the beginning of the pandemic everyone was coughing all over the place and kind of feeling odd and um when the uh, the last thing was when we had that conference and it, it it was very strange and then going back i mean i i it was exciting see, seeing it all again but but i i was aware of my just everything about my, me changed since since being being there at the time and it was almost like a kind of relic in some way it was strange it was it's like I've moved on from there in in, in, a, in a way um but Faye you you went back in the middle of lockdown didn't you that's right yeah I went back um I, it wasn't every we were all in lockdown and I went back um because I was worried about um the sun exposure on my drawings and I wanted to put some black bin liners or, um, and some paper against them, so to protect them really. And Judith let me in and it was so quiet. It was so weird because the AR, bil the ARB building is incredibly busy normally. You know, you've got so many people in and out, in and out. There's a wonderful cafe, restaurant place, full always, um, people, students everywhere, laptops open, chatting. It's so vibrant. So for me, it was really, it was really de deathly. Um, and I suppose I've been thinking a lot about exhibiting spaces and what sort of spaces I like to exhibit in. And actually, I like to exhibit in lively, bustly, ordinary, ordinary. I hope you don't mind me saying ordinary, Judith. But, you know, ordinary places. I don't necessarily want to be in a you know, a sort of little white cube where my circles are right now, actually. It's quite interesting because it's complete contrast. I loved all that bustle. And I, and um, yeah, it made me think a lot about exhibiting spaces and how, how, um, oh, I don't know, how, how, you know, you mentioned, Judith, that your, um, I forget the, the guy's name, your colleague was saying, 
you know, how good it was to see the art again on the walls when he re when everything reopened. And, you know, art nourishes us, doesn't it, in some way. But I, I think the art is nourished by the environment as well. I think it works both ways. And there's something about having a very lively place with lots of uh, mm. students around and people coming in and out to have a coffee or a lunch or whatever that makes, I don't know, it just makes it part of every day. It, it, you know, art becomes integrated into the everyday experience. And I love that. Hmm. I think that was a um, really nice res um, response because the, the, I think it's been the very peculiar thing about this exhibition that none of us expected this strange locking mm. down, shutting it up, and then coming back to it. Um, we have another question from Julia about objects in exile. Julia, do you want to ask your question? She's on mute. Oh. Oh. <laughs> Of objects for people. Oh, yeah. oh, she's, come, she's coming. Hi, can you hear me at least? I don't know if I can. Yes, we can oh, hear you. Yeah. Yes. Can I do it like this? Do you mind if I? It's just really nice to hear the different voices rather than just read oh, them out okay. the chat like a student lecture. Like this. Hello, Judy. Hello. Um, Faye, my question yeah. was really for you. I mean, it's obviously it's also for Judy, but it's I am very specifically interested in, as I say in my question, um, the role of objects for an exile. I'm writing about someone who collected stuff from her youth, She, um, and, well youth, from her first phase of her life before she was forced to leave the country she was living in. And I'm just always, without wanting to put, you know, thoughts into my person's head, I just wonder what must have felt like once you'd got all this stuff and they exhibited it and it was collected in a major archive in France, but whether ever it came to an end, the feeling of whatever that feeling is, that what you get when you're collecting or putting together stuff that's both meaningful and also has a sort of public element to it because you're exposing it in an exhibition. Yeah, good. Yeah, this is interesting. I mean, I'd never exhibited the objects themselves. Mm. And I wouldn't do that um, because I think they're private. I mean, I, I wave the watch around proudly, but that's as far as it goes. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't ever exhibit the objects. Um, that would be a step too far for me. Uh, I'm very happy to exhibit the drawings, my interpretation. Um, once, once the object's being processed through my, my, you know, creative lens or whatever you would call it. Um, no, the objects themselves are pretty sacred and they stay here. Uh, and they're in, they're in a very special place. Uh, no one so, can- So is the end point, the exhibition? Yes. Well, oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't think the, there is an end point until I die, really. I mean, who knows what, what these objects are going to do with me in 10 years time. I mean, I think I have to keep all options open. These objects are living. They're very, li they're very living. They're not dead in, in, they haven't got a finite life. They're living now, but I think it's an, in, they're living internally in my head, aren't they? I'm projecting all of this onto them. So it's when I die that, they will change, I think. And, you know, who will inherit them? Well, my kids will inherit them. What will they think? They might just chuck them all away um, because they won't hold any memories for the kids. I, 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 or they might decide, you know, their mum's mother's watch is actually quite a poignant object and it, it will remind them maybe of me rather than of my mum. No, these objects keep are living and they're demanding. They demand something of me now, you know. Um, they're not passive. Uh, and they will continue doing that until my death. And equally for Judy, my question similarly, it struck me that 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 what, what linked you to a sort of distance, that Faye's stuff was all quite close and your stuff was all terribly far away. And does that make it easier in a way to deal with difficult um, issues or thoughts or loss or stuff um, well, if it's far away? 
I mean, it's two separate things. I mean, I I was doing the um, photographing in, a, a, in observatories and you know taking photographs of stars because that was a, my passion, and um, it was only through um, putting together the Freud exhibition on Breathe and this show about early parental loss that um, it was you know Caroline Garland the psychoanalyst who came up with the idea that I was looking for my father in the stars I I don't know if I am or not it's it's hard to say but as a parallel thing I've been kind of um, I, I found that it's been this kind of through creativity finding trying to find out more about my father and I do have a few objects that I, my mother's given me and I've as as I've my kind of through my MA and artist books as I'm making um, I, I just kind of explore these things and you know more and more but in a more tangential way really not as the actual object so yes the near and far thing is 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 a fascinating question which I'm, I'm not sure I can I've re, you know I, it's not resolved in my head really um, because it's this huge void, which I'm trying in some way to fill. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Julia, can I just add one more thing? Um, which is the idea of the psychic home and where your home is, you know, where the soul is comfortable, where, where, where does your soul reside? And for me, I'm lucky. I can, you know, my soul is here. I was born quite close by. My friends and family are close by. Um, I feel very rooted here. Now, if, I was somebody in exile, as my dad was in a way, because he was born in Shanghai and came here after the war um, and never felt really settled here. You know, he was always, always felt an observer. And he brought his boyhood chess set um, from Shanghai here to, uh, to here um, and kept it. And I, I, you know, how did he view that? Was that a part of Shanghai and part of his his psychic soul of Shanghai, you know, where did his psychic soul really exist? Was it, was his soul in Shanghai, even though he was physically living in London? I, I, you know, I wish I'd talked to him about it. <laughs> um, there's a good book, which I'm going to quickly look at. So it's not that I'm being- Are we talking about Nafisi? That book. It's it's a brilliant book. I loved it. Um, I thought the standard <laughs> text was Nafisi. Anyway. Sorry, uh, you keep going. <laughs> Julia, I was going to say, I think it's a really interesting um, about that point where it's in the exhibition, the psychic home, as she declared it. Oh, I see that. Mm -hmm. Have you read that one? No, I've read. Um, mm. I've got to my bookshelf, but it, it, I've read. Um, <laughs> Or his first name, I've gone blank. Sorry. Um, anyway, yes. Yeah, sorry. The question. No, I'm... I was going to say that the at the point where Faye put something in an exhibition. Yeah, that's what I, I actually purchased one, or well, I was given as a present one of Hel Faye's drawings. So now it hangs above my bed, and mm -hmm. it's called Motherless. And actually, I think about my own mother when I look at it, and so the, the drawings now are kind of with me doing a completely different job than it was for Faye. And I think there's something really fascinating in these objects, how the, you know, they tr can transfer and be working in a, um, d like they, they can keep going through and they have this sort of life of their own and you've Faye's lost control of it in some way now. And you're like, and, and again, you know, what happens when it's no longer my drawing, who does it go to? And I, I think there's something really fascinating in that because the objects then are traveling in their own kind of, um, with their own agency. Mm -hmm. And each time they take a trace of the thing before and then they add these other layers to it. As uh, So I think it was a, a really nice how you put the question, Julian. Thank you. Is there anyone else? If not, I'm kind of mindful we've been in for over an hour. And the, um, the, the curse of the ages, Zoom fatigue. <laughs> so, um, I'd just like to thank everyone very much for attending and for really brilliant questions. Um, and to Fe, really to um, Faye and Judy for saying, why don't we do this event? Because um, I wasn't quite sure how it was going to work. Um, but I, I, I think it's actually been really nice to reflect on it um, and sort of bring it out of this. Um, 
having had it all frozen and locked down to bring it out and dust it off has been really enjoyable. So um, thank you to everybody. Thank you.